welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And we have another session tonight. This one is a city council session and we have an open seat. It's in District 1, it's Rosie Kruger's seat. And, and we've had a person, only one person <laughs> stepped forward for this seat and that's Lauren Hurl who's sitting next to me. Lauren, yeah. welcome thanks. to Montpelier City Forum. Yeah, thanks for having me. Sure. Can you do me a favor? Tell me where in this district Lauren Hurl lives. Yeah, I'm up on Deerfield Drive off of Terrace Street. So great neighborhood. And uh, I've got my, my little uh, four-year-old goes to preschool at Turtle Island on Elm Street, another part of the district. So spent a lot of time making the rounds. And you're near Hubbard Park. Yes, yeah. The west, the west entrance yep, to yep. Hubbard Park. Yes, so love to spend time there. This is a gig on city council that pays a thousand thousand five hundred or something on that level it pays very little yeah you also sit on committees besides sitting on council yep. and you sit through meetings that many of us or at least i find incredibly boring <laughs> why why would your family want you on city council yeah i mean to me in part i was inspired to run looking at what's happening in our country and to me, I see all these threats to civil rights, environmental protections, and just a whole host of values that, that I hold dear personally. And I know that cities and state governments can really show a different path and be inclusive and welcoming and um, support sustainability and other things that I really value. So I see an opportunity to, to see what the city of Montpelier, I think, you know, really embodies a lot of those values already in its city government. And so I'm excited to try to work with the city and keep fostering those kinds of values through our city government. Now how long have you been in Montpelier? I've been here about seven years. So moved up here. My older son is seven, turning eight soon, and um, had been living in D.C., working on federal policy and um, wanted, wanted to come to Vermont, where my husband's from. And uh, yeah, so settled here around then. Is Montpelier a city or a town? <laughs> I, I always ask that. That is not something that I'm, I'm springing on you. It's something that you people who followed this for a while know that this is a regular question because if you look at it as a city, it's one way. If you look yeah. at it as a town, it's another. What is Montpelier <laughs> to you? I think it's character characteristics of both. I mean, I my most recent before living here was Washington, D.C. and San Diego and those were you know a lot bigger population wise and felt like cities in that regard um, but I mean I think to me Montpelier has a density and the hub of state government and other things so it has you know I think a lot of the the resources and things that a city has so I think you know but city it's still in some ways a town but yeah it has you know it has like the benefits of city uh, city resources but a, a town feel where you you know know a lot of the people and and it's a great community and connections what is district one district where does one. district one follow if, if i were looking at a yeah. map what would district so if you're one looking be? at a map it's it's a kind of funky shape it goes up elm street and around all the, the meadows. way to where rosie kruger lives yeah all the way out there um and the meadows and then it goes up um, terrace street in the neighborhoods up there um, where i live and then out um, out on state street um, headed towards the dairy cream so what makes district one different than district two over by main street middle school and over by union elementary and district three that goes downtown and across the river what 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 kinds of unique situations do those people in district one face hmm. or what are their concerns uh, I mean, you must have walked a few houses yeah. to talk to your neighbors. Yeah, I mean, the, the top thing I'm hearing right now is infrastructure. And I mean, we had, even in my little neighborhood, we had a water main break and a um, little circle right near us. And so, I mean, that, just the access to clean, safe water and, um, you know, what kind of, what's going on with the, the water main breaks has been the top thing that everyone I've talked to has has brought up so definitely something um, excited to dig into you know what, what, so what is the plan <laughs> for uh, what is our what, what are our well council um, had started plan. to address that yep. at their last meeting yep. at least they had yeah. Tom McArdle from city services talking about that what's your thought yep. on on what's underneath those streets yeah do you feel good about that do you feel that in the long term that might be a problem or 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's something, you know, you obviously need to continually be investing in infrastructure. And I, you know, in my day job, I work a lot on climate change. So to me, I think really revisiting again as we need to continue doing, uh, you know, what is the, the plan for the investment and knowing that, you know, we're going to be having more and more weather extremes and, you know, so the kinds of cold and warming up um, events and, and that kind of thing and, you know, big precipitation events. How are we planning for it? Are, you know, is our plan building to the future that we know is coming? And so those are questions I'm really excited to look into and, um, and, and learn more about and, and figure out, you know, are we strategically investing now so that we can save money over the long term? Well, how would that be done? Can you talk well, a, a me, little bit about strategically investing now? Sure. For I mean, the long term? yeah, to me, I, I think it's, it's again thinking about, you know, are we putting infrastructure in that we're going to have to replace sooner if we're not building it to, um, you know, withstand the flooding and stuff that we know is, is likely to increase um, with climate change? So, what might have been, you know, a hundred year flood in the past are becoming more and more frequent. So, you know, are you, instead of having emergency responses or, or damaged infrastructure, um, you know, what, based on our best um, predictions, are we building to the kinds of standards and making investments? So, you know, I don't know how much the, the emergency responses are costing, but that cost versus just building out the infrastructure on a regular schedule um, so that we're maintaining it. And, you know, all accounts I've heard is that the city does a really good job and, you know, has a great program. And so it's really just looking at that and, um, and making sure, you know, how, how forward looking is it and Well, and we made a major investment versus. last year in wastewater. Yep. And uh, in that investment is embedded the possibility of actually generating um, power from that and yep. actually yeah. know, paying back to some degree. And I believe, actually I don't believe, Ann Watson has a show on this. It's really good <laughs> on the city budget that you can watch and this is where I got it from. Uh, Ann was saying that right now, it will generate enough to keep those facilities out there warmed. Yeah, that's great. Which is good. Yeah. So is that the kind of forward investment that you're thinking about in sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think any, you know, whatever, being able to learn lessons from creative projects that people are doing in other cities and towns and, you know, across the world, uh, I think there's a lot of really innovative thinking right now of, you know, how are especially around power generation and other things so that we're getting off of fossil fuels and also, you know, being much more efficient. And so being able to, to look at, you know, what kind of, um, how are we building to be as efficient as possible, as long lasting um, and resilient to, to the world, to our changing world. Now, Anne had spoken on that show that I'm referencing. Yeah. You really ought to watch it. <laughs> it's, a, it's an excellent show. Um, she was speaking of trying to extend district heat mm -hmm. to new customers. Yep. Uh, do you believe in the district heat project, the, the wood chip burner? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's great. I, you know, I spend my day job again working on climate change and other issues, and I think trying to get off fossil fuels is great. You know, as Vermonters, we we don't you know, extract fossil fuels. We don't employ people in, in the fossil fuel industry. So, you know, even putting aside the climate damage, we don't benefit from fossil fuels. Every, it's like, you know, eight eight se 80 cents out of every dollar we spend on fossil fuels goes right out of state. So if we could keep more energy using local products like wood, wood chips, I think that's just a great kind of project that we should be looking at as, you know, these high efficiency, so. Very now this is not on the table, but were it on the table, are windmills on yep. our our horizon? Yeah. You know, would you agree with that? I think above town. Above town. On over hmm. by over by Murray Hill in, in, <laughs> in that area, would you agree with wood with windmills locally? Just just assume it were on the table. I mean, potentially. I mean, I I'm open-minded about you know. I mean, I'm an environmentalist, and so I think you know you always have to look at what are the environmental costs and benefits and, you know, is that sensitive wildlife habitat and wetlands or is that, you know, a, pr a location that's good for wind? I mean, I think wind has to be part of our energy future. There's no way to meet our climate, our state's clean energy goals without wind. So finding the right places for it, um, I think we do have to do. And to me, you know, saying that we're going to just continue importing energy from elsewhere that's damaging another community is not really a fair and equitable approach to energy. So. 
um, if I had to look at wind turbines, but we were able to sustainably produce our own ener energy, I think that could be great if it was a good site for it. The Winooski. Yeah. Do we have a concern, you know, uh, about ice flows and the like? Should there be future planning in your mind on the Winooski? Because yeah. we just saw what a water main will do yeah. when it breaks <laughs> on Nelson and comes down to, to Main Street, and the Winooski's a heck of a lot closer. Yeah. Should we be concerned about the Winooski, given climate, that back-and-forth whiplash mm -hmm. of, of weather? Yeah, I mean, I think we absolutely should be looking at, you know, what are – what are our plans? How are we dealing with anticipated changes and ice flows? And you know, what kind of if we're putting new development in, are we ensuring that it's um, you know going to withstand flooding that could be anticipated? So I th you know I think it's something we everyone should be thinking about as we do look at development and making investments and you know how we're how we're managing the river to keep everyone safe and people's property safe. In terms of managing the river, uh, the Confluence Park, any feelings yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I love green space, That's right next, I to, think. That's right <laughs> next to the river. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've river. seen some of the, the, the schematics of it. I mean, to me, that would be a great, great thing to, to have, you know, even having two young kids, having nice places like that to gather in our downtown, I think would be great. Um, so I, I'm... I'm supportive of that. You know, I know that there's lots of different proposals for using these little chunks of land. So, um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not sure about what all of the options are, but to me, using at least some of it for the park seems like a great kind of gathering and um, and positive space for the community. Montpelier has always struggled with the push me pull me of housing. Yep. In, in terms of not being enough housing, in terms of the housing the rental housing being extremely expensive. Yep. What's your thought on what council can do to help in terms of housing? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to be looking at, um, you know, do we have, I know that the, the zoning has been, um, is being looked at right now. And so, you know, are, do we have policies that are supportive of dense housing? Or do we have Well, we've just gone through the, the zillion year master plan. Yep. Where yep. everybody, sat in that <laughs> process and i suppose it's for the best that nobody really walked out of there happy <laughs> that, that a good every, compromise yeah it was a compromise <laughs> and, and i think that's what you really want is that you know it didn't spawn too many lawsuits right. and, it, and people walked out of there feeling somewhat yep. better but again what does that do for housing in town yeah i mean i think we need to be making sure that any policy that we're putting in place and that we're um, looking at the kind of investments the city can make to to ensure that we can develop I, I think affordable housing and all kinds of housing really in Montpelier are essential and even thinking about things like you know how are we supporting um, our net zero goals I think affordable housing is a crucial part of that because the more that we can have people living in downtown that can walk places that can have different um, ways of getting around that can bike and do other things you know I, th I think Montpelier is exactly the kind of place we should be putting housing and um, and having a, a robust uh, robust development um, in Montpelier so I think the city needs to be looking at what more can we be doing whenever anyone mentions net zero yep I always ask what is net zero what is sustainable Montpelier to you yeah I mean to me it, it, it is trying to achieve a community where we are producing the energy that we're using or able to use renewable energy um, for what we need a big part of that is um, reducing the amount of energy that we're using as a community which again you know the more that we're getting out of our cars and have other transit op opportunities to get around. Um, you know, in Vermont, heating our homes and getting around are the two ways, the biggest ways we use energy. And so if we can um, do things like supporting weatherizing more Vermonters' homes, um, then they're saving money and more what comfortable. What can we as a city do? I, I know what we as a federal government can do. I know yeah. what we as a state can do. But what, what can we as a as a city do within our current tax structure. Now I'll sit and play devil's advocate, yeah. realizing that our taxes, school and city, yeah. are amongst the highest in the state. Yeah. And higher taxes, 
generally when you're trying as you guys are yeah. an eight year old and what a four year old yeah four and seven yeah four and seven young families yeah. and higher taxes mean fewer young families mean schools that are less populated yeah. and just put more pressure on the school district how do we keep montpelier affordable at the same time as we try and encourage weatherization and the like yeah i mean to me weatherization that's something that you know there's there's an upfront investment and then you save money over the long term so i think the beauty of it is if we can spur the investment, if there's ways that you can try to um, give people low or no interest loans or other things because we know the payback is there, right. then you know, I think that's, that's what the city could be looking at. You know, what more are we doing? I know the state right now is having a lot of conversations about increasing funding, so maybe some of it even is education programs so people know that the resources are there and, um, and supporting that kind of thing because um, you know, I, th I think it is an affordability thing to, you know, not be heating the outside and keep more of your money, um, you know, spend less on whatever fuel you're using to heat your home. Uh, so I, I think supporting programs like that are actually good affordability programs. Could you just briefly discuss the city's charter issue on, on energy and energy standards? Yeah, and I that's have up for vote on, on town meeting day. Yes, and I have a lot to learn, but um, about it, but. Um, you know, so, so there's been a discussion for, I, I've been kind of part of this discussion at the State House and some of my work of, you know, how do we let people know how much it costs to heat a home and how are we putting energy, energy efficiency requirements and labeling. Um, and, you know, when I bought my home, I had no idea what it was going to cost to heat it and how much I was going to pay. And so, you know, as you're doing your calculation as a potential home buyer, and you know they showed me a nice tour of how weatherized it was but then we started getting our first heating oil bills and it was like wow this is really expensive to, to heat our house um, and so i think it would have been really helpful and informative to say like build into your home budget that it's going to cost this much and by the way you know here are things you can do to save money by making investments now that you're going to cut down that use so I think I, I would think it's a great kind of concept and they've struggled with it at the state level. I think being able to model it in the city and show that it actually is benefiting consumers and people, home buyers and renters to try to, to get a better grasp on what are we spending on this and what kind of programs, once you're aware, you know, how, what programs are so out there to help people do it. So you would require an energy audit to be done by the owner before selling? Potentially. Um, yeah, this is where I, I need to learn more about what exactly is being required, but well, I think there are, um, I mean, that, that is one thing that, that I know in the state policy has been talked about is, is that that would be part of the, the sale process is that you have. Again, if I can reference that excellent <laughs> show that Ann Yeah, but I need to watch that. <laughs> that you people need to watch. Very good show. Yes, uh, I look forward um, to it. Ann talks about that. Good. And she said that what this charter change would do yep. is to allow the discussion to be open. Yep. And then once the discussion is opened, then the public can talk about what kinds of ordinances yep. are desirable or not desirable. Yep. Yeah. But this allows the conversation to come open to the floor. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's the kind of discussion I know has been happening at the state level. Um, so I, you know, I think you know, hearing a lot of perspectives on what could we be doing and what makes sense and you know, obviously always wanting to be very aware of if you're, um, if you're putting new requirements on, who who is that cost falling onto, and you know, being very you know, mindful of like those who can least afford to pay those costs. What are we doing to ensure that we're not putting burdens on people that can't afford it, but are doing a program that I that could actually save people a lot of money over the long term and help make life more affordable. Realizing renters aren't there for the long term. Right, but even if a, a apartment building gets weatherized, then eventually rents should be able to come down if you're spending less money, um, you know. In theory. In theory, putting heat through the, through the walls. <laughs> downtown, Montpelier's downtown. Yeah. It, at the end of the day, is a very charming downtown with all kinds of, it's a downtown, let me rephrase that, it's a downtown that um, redevelopment really didn't happen. That, uh, that in the 70s, while other towns had their old buildings ripped down, we only had a, a beautiful old building that now is an ugly, an ugly post office. <laughs> but other than that, we pretty much 
ended up intact. We've got a bunch of downtown businesses and they're struggling in the same way that small towns are struggling yeah. everywhere. How do we help our downtown to, to survive as, as a small downtown um, amongst many small downtowns? Montpelier is not in any way, shape, or form extraordinary either way. It's not extraordinarily turning itself out for people. Uh, it's not something that's fading because of anything that the business people are doing. Mm -hmm. It's caught in a macro issue mm -hmm. of downtowns, no matter whether they're in the suburbs, no matter whether they're in the big cities, no matter in the, whether they're in small towns. Mm -hmm. what, can, what do you think council can do to help our downtown? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think one of the things I've been thinking about are, you know, are there are there things the city can do? You know, when you think about a company like Amazon that's out there and is such a hard competitor for so many of our downtown businesses, um, you know, are there are there ways that we can, um, you know, look at what the city is purchasing and work with other cities across the state, across a broader region, perhaps? I know a lot of um, coalitions coalitions have formed among mayors and others around things like climate action. Can those kinds of um, coalitions be leveraged to look at, you know, can we use our purchasing power together to be, you know, supporting local businesses and, you know, within our own communities? So I think, you know, trying to, to get creative of what ways can we um, make sure that the activities we're doing, the investments that the city is making, you know, are we, are we really supporting those local businesses? So I'm sure there's a lot, a lot more to think about, but definitely well, an issue I want to be. Embedded in the city budget is $100,000 for our economic development, mm -hmm. Montpelier Economic Development Corporation. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an additional 10,000 for Montpelier Alive. Mm -hmm. Those organizations, what do you think about them? I think I think it's great. I met with the executive director, and I mean, it sounds like having um, executive director of, of, of the Montpelier Development Corporation, Laura. Laura. Right. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I mean, I think it sounded like her role of being able to both help businesses navigate the the permit process and all of that, and be kind of maintaining the the vision for how we're making sure that development is you know, the way we want it to be happening in the city and assuming that it is, that we're, we're helping facilitate that. Um, I, you know, it seems like a, a smart investment to have somebody f laser focused on that and trying to, um, to, you know, advance our goals as a city. Um, we've also embedded in the budget somewhere mm -hmm. uh, our funds for the, um, the regionalization of our police, uh, not our police, but um, our dispatch. Mm -hmm and trying to get a multi approach to that. And then we haven't been able to bring that home and it's been going on for a few years. Yeah. What do we do with that? Do we finally say, hey, this isn't working? Or do you think we ought to keep pushing at it? Yeah, I mean, definitely an issue I need to learn a lot more about, like all of these. So probably in a year I go back and watch this and say, oh my God, <laughs> so much to learn. But, um, you know, from what I have have learned from talking to Donna Bate and some others about this issue. Um, I mean, it sounds like there's there already is kind of regional responses that happen anyway, and so it you know I think even if it feels like we're banging our head against a wall, like we need to keep having those conversations and see what kind of regional approaches could make sense. Um, given that you know doing everything in isolation, the the big investments that, you know, it sounds like we need a new fire truck soon and that's a million dollar investment and things like that. You know, how are we um, working collaboratively with others? And, you know, it sounds like some new relationships and other things have formed. So maybe it's slow, but maybe progress is being made. So I think we should when keep we exploring it. When we speak about Donna, Donna sits on the Transportation Committee. Yep. And she's in that transportation planning mode. Uh, last election, Connor Casey sat next to me, mm -hmm. and I asked him a question. I ask everyone, and I'll ask you. In fact, I asked Donna. Um, if there's an organization that's a quasi-governmental organization, mm -hmm. Consul has a representative on it. And I asked Connor, where do you see yourself as most productive? Mm -hmm. And Connor said, I would like to be the Consul representative on Montpelier Alive. Yeah. Connor is now the council representative on Montpelier Alive. Yeah. Which quasi-governmental body would you see yourself sitting on? Yeah, I mean, there's, 
There's a few. I do think there's the a library. I know I'll there's, you a there's lie, so there's many. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I definitely. I think my my background working on a lot of issues with um, environmental issues and the intersection with transportation and so on. I, I'm very interested in that as well. Um, so I probably would try to find, you know, somewhere that I could put the just kind of expertise that I actually have to work. So um, something in the, the the planning and I mean, there's a, there's there's so many options, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll have to see what you know where the need is too. The recreation department. Yep. Um, any thoughts? on the Recreation Center over on Derry Street. Uh, the plans that have been in the making on a much more elaborate facility. Yep. Any thoughts on that? Because you're going, that yeah. will be presented to the council yep. that you are going to sit on. Yeah, yeah. Unless, of course, there's a, a massive write-in campaign maybe. that you don't know about. <laughs> you never know, you know, democracy, <laughs> keep it vibrant. But any thoughts um, on Yeah, I mean, I, we, use the the rec center now for my you know kiddos basketball and stuff so you know i i was excited to see that the conversation around upgrading that is happening i think um it seems definitely like time i know that you know from as as a parent of small children i was like in the camp of those who are like an indoor pool would be such a great thing for the community i don't know if the city necessarily needs to be the one to be uh, building, maintaining, operating that. I think looking if there are opportunities to partner with, um, you know, with First and Fitness or some other entity mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, trying to get creative around that. You know, it seemed like there were definitely a set of, um, of people based on the responses that would be interested in that. Um, I don't know that um, it looked like the potential cost per person was pretty high. So, yeah, high. you know, I think looking at the, at what kind of partnering opportunities there might be would be one way to, to, to explore that avenue and you know I do love the having the rec center right walkable downtown is such a nice location so being able to keep that makes a lot of sense to me but lots more to learn and dig into on that one now of course there's an elephant in this room I always say that, I love <laughs> saying that, that every week there's some, the, elephant. Every, there's some <laughs> element of the elephant sitting in the room in every one of these shows <laughs> and this one is a parking garage mm -hmm. and the question is the legal morass that the parking garage finds itself in. Yeah. How do we find our way out? I know that this is, I think part of it might be Act 250, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. But I know that Act 250 stuff goes on and on and then on and on. How do we find ourselves, uh, our way out of this so that the Hilton doesn't back out? But at the same time, you don't leave a set of people feeling that they've been ignored, marginalized, mm -hmm. and that their concerns over the environment are not legitimate. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope... Consul is in the middle of that yeah, one, as, yeah, as yeah. well as the mayor. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that and hope that there are a lot of robust conversations happening with the, the um, people who have filed the petition and the, and the other, um, you know, and really kind of working through what are the concerns, what can be addressed, what might not be able to be, but you know, what's the explanation and what's the rationale for, for why. Um, I mean, to me, we had a democratic process and the city voted a certain way, so I would hope people could come together and try to make it the best possible project. You know, I think there's opportunities of, you know, can we get solar on it? Can we make it a big EV charging station? Can we, you know, What is ensure? the EV charging station? caught me in a, you know, using some jargon, an electric vehicle <laughs> <laughs> charging station. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that, that there can be, you know, a lot of work done compromises. together, compromises and, and really, you know, working through what are the, what are the core of the issues that people are concerned about so that um, we can get to the other side of it. City Council, after the election, in the beginning of the, the term, City Council will meet in a retreat mm -hmm. and we'll set out next year's goals. Mm -hmm. And I always ask this question as well. Mm -hmm. This is a legitimate one. Mm -hmm. You're going to be sitting in that room. There's reasons that you're running. Do you have an advocacy that you would like to see in that list of goals that City Council will have that is your own? That's something that you would like to see as policy at least attention towards? 
Yeah, I mean, my, my top priorities um, right now are, you know, and I, I, I don't know that I would say that they're my own, because I think they're things that are, have been worked on already by city council and will probably continue, but things that I would be particularly interested in prioritizing are, you know, again, the kind of resilient infrastructure, the net zero, and really, you know, what is the, what is the plan? We've got a great vision. How do we really get there? Um, and, you know, making tangible progress towards that. Um, I, I'm, you know, interested in the whole, you know, for the rec center as a young, as a parent with young children, and I think I'm the only person who would be serving on council with that perspective. You know, I know some of them have o older children, um, but being able to bring that perspective of, you know, what what policies are we doing and how how does it in impact um, children, families, um, you know, who might consider moving here, who are living here, um, and and also I think equity, inclusion, racial justice. You know, what are we doing to be a welcoming, inviting city? Um, and, you know, how are we actually helping address income inequality instead of perhaps doing things that might be exacerbating it, even unintentionally? What would those things be? I, I'm just curious. How can, we, how can we as a city be exacerbating it except super high rent? You know? Well, I mean, that's where I think even you can be working on a well-intentioned policy that, you know, if it, if it's, a flat fee for everyone that lower income people get disproportionately that's a that's a bigger hit on them than it is so can you you know scale things progressively so that you know maybe there's a carve out for certain income levels or it you know depending on the your property value you pay different amounts and so i think there's ways of of just looking through the lens of are we you know with something you know like if you for example the um a weatherization program at the at the state we've talked about you could not pass along the any you couldn't do a rent increase related to that so you know, can you build into that because there's going to be the cost savings over time so you know saying we're going to make you pay up front for our upfront expense um, and then we'll reap all the benefit later uh, is not fair so you know those kinds of things but just being really careful that you're not inadvertently you know going to bump up rent for people or um, that when you can craft a policy uh, more in a more nuanced way that can address those up front. As we approach legalization of marijuana mm -hmm. and, and sale of, of marijuana in town, is there any concerns that you have on that particular issue when we do have stores that will be selling marijuana in 2019, 2020 certainly, but possibly 2019? You, uh, now again, Very. that's a state, that's a state <laughs> policy. State it's, policy, it's, yeah, yeah. It's not a local one, but how do you see that playing into um, any kind of existing drug problems? If we have existing drug problems yeah. in this town, do you think we have existing drug problems in this town? I think every town has some existing drug problems. Um, you know, I mean, I I think that's one that I would really try to. You know, this this is a policy. You know, sometimes Vermont's out front pushing things. This is one that we're you know, we have a number of states to look at and learn from. So I think looking at, you know, even similar sized cities and towns and what, you know, in Colorado and Washington and, mm. you know, what have, what have they dealt with and are there things that we can try to proactively put in place. So that's kind of where I would start on that one is, you know, what, what kind of lessons can we learn from neighbors that have already dealt with this and gone through it first? And um, As a town so rather than as a state. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, both from the city perspective and I know that, you know, a lot of those conversations are happening at the state house, but I think for the actual, you know, what does that look like in, in Montpelier, you know, what can we, what can we learn and try to get out ahead of? Now your family is ready to have you gone <laughs> <laughs> for long stretches on, on Wednesday night, right? Yep, they are, they are, luckily, very supportive family. <laughs> at this point, yes. At this point, <laughs> yes, ask me again and <laughs> well, I want to thank you for coming down because you didn't have to. You're running unopposed, <laughs> and that's in District 1, so I would urge you to vote for her. She's <laughs> very qualified, as well as very affable. <laughs> and um, I want to thank you for watching this. But before I let you go, get out there and vote on Town Meeting Day. That's really important. I realize that there are no challenged races in this town this time. But get out there anyway, because voting is a good habit to make. And make sure your friends vote. And watch the other shows, particularly the one with Ann Watson. I'm pushing that one this year. 
Uh, thank you so very much for watching. Thank you. Thanks. What'd you think? It's fun. <laughs> See? <laughs>